I'm looking over the Dharma Trading Company website because I am going to be printing out the safety data sheets for each of the acid dyes that I have in my collection. And the reason why I'm doing that is, well, obviously acid dyes are hazardous when you, um, if you were to breathe them in or get them into your eyes or any of your, like, you know, your mucous membranes or anything like that, it can be really dangerous. Um, so there's, uh, safety data sheets that go along with the dyes and what I want to do is print them out, compile them into a binder so that when I go to use a particular dye I can reference it and understand a little bit about the hazards that go along with that particular dye. Once you probably become familiar with one, um, you probably won't have to reference it every time, but it's just a way to kind of know uh, what you're dealing with and if it's something that you maybe shouldn't be using for speckling yarn because even though you might be wearing a mask and gloves um, speckling yarn is kind of it's speckling dye over the yarn and it's shaking the little dye powders loose onto the yarn and those kinds of things can become airborne in that particular situation rather quickly and so maybe more hazardous acid dyes are not ones that I feel comfortable using for those types of techniques so I don't know I just um, that's what I'm doing right now and I feel as an independent dyer, a uh, hobby dyer, um, it's really important and I have a responsibility to you, my viewers, and anybody else who might be wanting to take this on as a hobby to let you know that this is a very hazardous um, craft when not taken seriously and when the pro proper precautions aren't um, put into place. Like I wear, you know, a, a respiratory mask, gloves, um, making sure that you're not doing anything that causes the dye to become airborne when there's pets or children or other family members around. Just, you know, the, the common sense stuff, that this isn't rocket science, but um, it is a responsibility, I think, of any ND dyer or any hobby dyer that's talking about it and sharing it with their viewers that they talk about that kind of thing. So that's what I'm doing right now. So um, I'll turn my camera so you can see, kind of like the screen, what I'm working on. Well, not working on, but what I'm looking at. I'm going to print these out um, and I'll link where I found these exactly on Dharma's website. You have to kind of go down to the very bottom of any page and it shows you a link for safety data sheets, but that's what this is. So it just tells you um, the identification code, it tells you how to use it, um, it, gives you an inform it gives you information about where the supplier is, and then it gives you a classification. So this particular die right here is classified as not dangerous. Um, according to the globally harmonized system. Um, it's not a hazardous product. So interesting enough, I always thought all acid dyes were hazardous. This one here doesn't really mention it being very hazardous. Um, but anyway, I think it's just good to kind of have this information available to you at any given time so that you can prepare yourself and just be knowledgeable about what you're doing. I think anytime you get into something like this where you're pretty much working with chemistry, um, you're performing, you know, chemical experiments almost, I think you have to take that seriously and you have to think about what that entails. Um, so that's, that's what I'm doing right at this very moment. I have a lot of things going on today, so I'm going to be sharing a lot of them with you. But the first thing that I decided I was going to do is sit down and take this seriously and print some of these out. So I'm going to bookmark this. And then when I get done doing some other things that I'm doing down here today, I'm gonna go and print these out. So I highly recommend that if you are also doing this at home, um, as I know um, several of you that have commented on the Ravelry page are getting into this, which is so exciting. Um, I love to be on this journey with you. Um, but just so you know, I'm doing it, you should do it. Um, it's just the right thing to do, it's just common sense. All right.
outside and there's a guy who's um, mowing the lawn outside so it's loud. But anyway, I'm out here. I have a giant hank of Lion Brand uh, fisherman's wool that I'm gonna start spinning into a um, kind of a skein of yarn, a few separate skeins of yarn, because I wanna use this to practice some kind of dip dye techniques. I wanna do, I wanna take some dye stock solution, water it down, get a diluted solution, dip dye with that, and then I'm gonna use a more concentrated solution. Um, see what I can come up with. So let's, uh, if, I can, if you can hear me over this lawn maintenance that's happening out here, let's go ahead and get started. hank of Lion Brand Fisherman's Wool yarn here ready to go. Um, I'm going to stick this into a mordant solution and while I'm letting this one um, sit in that solution, I am going to wind this one up into a second skein so I can do two different uh, versions of what I'm doing to kind of see if there's color variation. So that's what I'm going to do next. You can't go over there. What's the matter? is to try to figure out how I can use the standard dye stock solution recipe and create um, different values of color but starting with that base point. Dharma Trading Company recommends for their dye stock solution eight ounces of water to a half ounce of dye powder unless you're using dark navy or dark black it's a full ounce of dye powder to eight ounces of water and then that gives you that base foundation dye stock solution which you can add to um, a pot of water if you're gonna be doing an immersion dye depending on how uh, saturated you want that color that determines how much dye stock solution you're gonna add or if you're doing hand painting you can add some water to your dye stock solution or the other way around you can add some dye stock solution to a preset amount of water to create various values of your color um, if you're doing a kettle dye same thing so I just want to kind of play with that concept right now when I've been working with my dye stock I've just had I've just been mixing up uh, powder and water creating kind of like a generic dye stock solution like this particular one here I don't know the the ratio of dye powder to water that I used to I mean I can tell how much water I use because I know how much this holds but I don't know how much dye powder I use I didn't keep track I should have but I didn't what are you gonna do I want to figure out how to make this more standard so it's easier for me to keep track of my various different dye stock solutions that I create to produce different values of color and a truck is going by right oh it's FedEx is hammering with a little plastic orange hammer. It's so cute. All right, so my yarn is ready to come out of the Morton bath, so I'm gonna squeeze it out into the tub of water and then I'm gonna run it through a salad spinner. ready to go. It's uh, damp. I let it drip out so it wasn't super wet, so it's just kind of damp. Um, I have my pot here. I have water in there, just enough water to allow my yarn to kind of move freely around. Um, this is just an old wooden knitting needle that's long enough to sit on top of my pot so that I can drape part of the yarn over the top while some of the yarn is being dipped into the dye. Thermometer and then um, 
my two dye sock solutions. This is a standard solution um, using the eight ounces of water to the half ounce of dye. However, I've also added an additional two cups of water to this to really dilute it down because I'm looking for a real pale sand color. And then this same exact dilution, but this is that ballerina pink color, so I'm hoping to get something that's um, very pale. I'm not using all of this in the dye bath, I'm only going to use a portion of it. So I have a measuring cup here that I use for my dye. I'm going to measure out a certain amount and then add it to the water and then that will be what I use to dye the yarn and it helps me keep track of how much I'm using. Okay, so my dye has exhausted out of the dye bath. You can actually see that. See that the water is clear. Okay, so I'm going to lift that yarn out of the water, um, rest it on top of the pot on my knitting needle, add the new dye, and then add the bullet, uh, plain portion of the yarn, and we'll have a two-tone yarn. So I'm going to pull it out so you can see the difference in the colors. So this is the pink that I dipped first. I let it completely exhaust, the water became clear, and then I added the sand dune color. And that's what we have. So there's three good colors in there. So I'm down here looking at my dye stocks and that second skein of yarn that I created from the fisherman's wool, I was going to use the same colors that I did on the previous one, but just in a different quantity to see the different values of color. But I don't know if I really need to do that. Um, I kind of get the idea that they're going to change um, in value by adding less or adding more. So what I want to do is try a, um, a single color that I already have mixed over here and do kind of like a tonal... Um, single color tonal dye using that dip dye method and see what I come up with. I've done it once before with the red um, yarn that I created a few times back, but I want to try it again with that lichen color um, and see what it looks like. So I'm going to try that now and I will show you the results when it's all done. Okay, so I'm out on my patio right now and I have the yarn that I just pulled out of the dye bath and I'm really happy with the way it turned out. So you can see that there is definitely a cool like variation in color happening here. Um, this is um, a really pretty bright saturated pink, a little bit more so than I was expecting with the amount of dye that I used in the water. But I really like it, I think it looks great, and I think it looks really pretty with this um, sand dune color. So that's a dip dye, and I like it. I almost think I kind of prefer this to kettle dyeing for multiple colors. All right, so I'm just gonna let this hang out um, for a few minutes, I'm gonna wash it, and then I'm gonna hang it out to dry, and then tomorrow I will check it out and twist it into a hank. Okay, so UPS just got here with something that I'm excited about. So we're gonna go downstairs, check it out in the dye studio slash garage. Okay, so these are plastic squeeze bottles. So what's really special about these squeeze bottles is that, number one, they're squeeze bottles, which makes it really easy to deposit dye if you're hand dyeing. But um, they have really small increment measurements. Let's see if you can, there we go. So they have all of these measurements, which make it really easy to mix up your dye stock for a particular colorway. And because they have those little uh, measurement increments on here, I know that if I'm mixing up um, a more diluted dye stock, I can add the dye stock, the standard solution, eight ounces to half ounce, and then I can add an additional amount of water to create a total amount of dye stock for a particular color value that I'm going for. And these just will make that a lot easier. Um, because they have the small increment measurements. It starts at a fluid ounce, goes all the way up to the 16 fluid ounces, one ounce um, 
at a time. So yeah, really excited about these. I just got them on Amazon by Tovla, Tovla Gourmet. So yeah, I'm excited to use these to mix up dye stock next time. I think this will make it a lot easier. All right. Good morning. I am in my kitchen right now, getting ready to have some coffee. Um, and then I'm gonna take you and show you the yarn that we dyed yesterday. And then I'm going to re-skein it and make it look nice and pretty. All right, we'll see you in a minute. All right, so I have the yarn that we dyed yesterday and I'm really, really happy with the way that it came out. You saw it in the previous clip. Um, it was still kind of wet and now it is all dry. And this is what it looks like. It, uh, everybody who's seen it, I've shown my brother and I've shown my husband and my mom and my dad because they were all here last night and they all said the same thing. It looks like Neapolitan ice cream and it really does. It's like the perfect colorway name for this <laughs> but anyway I really really love the way that it dried just like any fiber as it dries the color is going to mute down a little bit just like when your hair is wet it always looks a little bit darker than it does when it's dried out um and that's what's happening here so when we saw it yesterday when it was all wet it definitely looked a little bit more saturated in color and now the way that it's dried and the way that the color has um kind of muted itself as it's dried is really, really pretty. I'm almost liking it more than I did when I saw it before. This pink, which I don't go for pink. I'm not one to to go for pink. But it's fun. It's a lot of it's a lot of fun. And it's just an experimentation in color. And so that's that's what's important here. So anyway, I really, really like this. Now um, what I want to do with this, because this is an all natural wool and it's more coarse, um, it doesn't kind of slide over, the strands don't slide over one another as easily as maybe like a, a merino with a nylon um, mixed in wood. And so the skein tends to kind of get a little frumpled and, and tangly, you can see in these little spots right here, um, is I would like to re-skein this. That means I'd like to take it from this skein and spin it into another loop like this and then twist it into a hank. But I'm kind of bummed about doing that because I know that when I do that, it's going to redistribute the yarn, therefore redistributing the colors, creating a different color pattern, and I really like the way that it looks like this. Um, so my challenge in that case would be, how, well, okay, so here's my question that I'm asking myself. How do you take this, spin it into a new hank, and then spin it back so that you get the same color pattern? And I don't know if that's something you can do in any reasonable amount of time. Um, so I think that if I spin this into a new hank, I may not get the same, I may not ever be able to get back to this exact same color pattern unless I re-spin it over and over again until I reach this, which I'm not gonna do that. But, you know, whatever. I, I would like to use this as a way of demonstrating to you that when you spin yarn into a different skein or when you re-skein yarn, it does give you an idea of what that color pattern is going to do when it's all knit up and the colors are redistributed. So this would provide kind of like a micro stripe, I guess you could say, with the little stripes throughout. That's what I would predict if I were to reskein this. So I'm going to go ahead and give it a shot, but before I do that, I'm going to twist it up into a hank the way it is and take a picture of it just because it's so pretty, just like this.
Skein or Hank, and you can see that there's um, some striping going on. There's uh, some more solids on one side. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this into a Hank, and we'll see what it looks like. <laughs> All right, so I'm happy with the way that it turned out. Actually, way happier than I thought I would be after you know worrying about um, losing that pretty color blocked effect. But you know what? It actually has kind of retained a little bit of that. So that's awesome. All right, so there you have it. We're on our way to Boulder City. We're um, which is just it's kind of like do east of here and we're gonna go check out a have some breakfast and then we're gonna check out a little craft slash yarn store that's kind of a hidden gem in that area so come along and see what we find 